Before I start the content of this video, let me run you through the main topics of this video. First of all, I briefly narrate two stories and then we look at some of the common conceptions and misconceptions of greatness in contrast with real or authentic greatness. To explain further, the concept of social metaphysician will be introduced. Then I will discuss the hazards of being a social metaphysician. The psychology of a rational man will be dealt with next, which leads us to the characteristics and definition of a hero. Next, I deal with heroes who are morally flawed. After that, I come to the issue of everyman and heroism. And lastly, I end the talk by treating the topic of hero worship. Let me start by telling you two stories, both of which are personal to me to help you understand the background and motivation behind the making of this video. Firstly, I'd like to share that as far back as I can remember, I've always wanted to be great. What I mean by that is that I held greatness as a supreme or the highest value in life. That is, I considered achieving greatness as most important in life and esteemed it more than anything else. But I must say that what constitutes real or actual greatness, that is what I consider to be great has undergone a lot of changes and revisions since childhood. I am saying this to tell you that the topic of this video is of utmost importance to me in a personal sense and not just in a professional sense. Keeping that in mind, let me also share with you the second personal story which triggered the process of making this video. A couple of days ago, while, while I was going on an evening walk, I took along with me my neighbor's kid who is of 13 or 14 years old. While we were walking, the boy talked a lot of random things and mentioned that he recently watched a movie named KGF and found the lead actor of the movie to be great and heroic. After hearing this from the boy, I asked him, what is it that he considers to be great? Firstly, he tried to answer by saying that the protagonist in the movie is great because he overcame insurmountable obstacles and fought valiantly with his enemies. After hearing this, I pointed out that the protagonist of the movie is actually a hardcore criminal who does not care to harm people by using physical force and violence to achieve his goal and ask the boy whether he considers it to be right and whether such a person should be regarded as great or heroic. Hearing this, the boy said no and when I pressed him further to answer the question of who is great and what is greatness, he pointed out some people who, whom he considered great. But when I showed the flaws in these people and certain bad or contradictory elements present in them which are not praiseworthy, the boy got perplexed and begged me to change the topic or subject as he got irritated. What the boy couldn't grasp was the distinction between a hero and a non-hero and how to rationally evaluate a morally flawed hero of mixed qualities of goodness and badness. I hope that by the end of this video, you will not only be able to distinguish a hero from a non-hero, but also evaluate the flaws and the good qualities of a person in a rational way. Now let us look at some of the common conceptions of greatness. The first common conception of greatness is what I call greatness in the eyes of others as opposed to greatness in the real and objective sense. You will find out in the course of this video that wanting to be perceived as great by others without first determining what greatness means objectively is a very dangerous idea. And when one subscribes to such a notion of greatness, it will lead to one's downfall both existentially and psychologically. 
The other common misconception regarding greatness is that greatness involves self-sacrifice and selflessness. It will be shown in the course of this video that heroes achieve greatness by pursuing goals favoring their self-interest in a rational way and not by acts of selflessness. To describe the set of people who value greatness in the eyes of others over real greatness, let me introduce the term called social metaphysician, which was coined by the American psychologist Nathaniel Brandon. Brandon, who is regarded as the father of the self-esteem movement, wrote in his book, The Psychology of Self-Esteem, that, quote, this is the phenomenon that I designate as social metaphysics. Metaphysics is one's view of nature of reality. To the psychoepistemological dependent, reality for all practical purposes is people. In his mind, in his thinking, in the automatic connections of consciousness, people occupy the place which in the mind of a rational man is occupied by reality. Social metaphysics is a psychological syndrome that characterizes a person who holds the minds of other men, not objective reality, as the ultimate psychoepistemological frame of reference." Unquote. It is helpful to note that the term psychoepistemology, which is used by Brandon, was a term coined by the philosopher cum novelist Ayn Rand and is defined as, quote, the study of man's cognitive processes from the aspect of the interaction between the conscious mind and the automatic functions of the subconscious." Unquote. To put it in simple terms, a person's psychoepistemology is quote, his self-programmed method of mental functioning. Unquote. Let me make the phenomenon of social metaphysics more clear by stating that quote, a man of self-esteem and sovereign consciousness deals with reality, with nature, with an objective universe of facts. He holds his mind as his tool of survival and develops his ability to think. But the psychoepistemological dependent lives not in a universe of facts, but in a universe of people. People, not facts, are his reality. People, not reason, are his tool of survival. It is on them that his consciousness must focus. Reality is reality as perceived by them. It is they who he must understand or please or placate or deceive or maneuver or manipulate or obey. It is his success at this task that becomes the gauge of his efficacy, of his competence at living." Unquote. One of the fallacies committed by social metaphysicians is that of reversing the relationship between cause and effect. A rational person functions on the principle that attaining real greatness by achieving things which are objectively valuable is the cause, which will grant him the effect of being perceived as great by other rational people. On the other hand, a social metaphysician functions on the principle and on the premise that if I manage to make other people think that I am great, that is, if other people perceive me as great, then I will have attained real or authentic greatness. In fact, such a person tries to attain self-esteem or rather pseudo self-esteem by putting a lot of effort on being perceived as great by others as if the, their perception and their evaluation of his pseudo greatness will grant him real greatness. So by seeking the effect which is admiration he tries to gain real greatness which is the cause. In this way the social metaphysician not only fails to comply with the law of causality, which is inviolable, but also tries to reverse it. But such an attempt is not only futile, as reality will not permit it, but also fatal, 
So it's going against reality, it's going against life. I'm not saying that designing appreciation or admiration implies lack of independence, but stating that such admiration must be earned from people whom you value and for things or qualities you achieved, which you yourself value. One needs to grasp that there is a difference between the psyche of the person who wants to be causelessly admired by everyone indiscriminately and the person who desires rational admiration. Now that we have looked at the psychology of a social metaphysician which is pathological in nature, let us turn our attention to the mental processes of a psychologically healthy rational man. A rational man has quote, a profound respect for facts, a profound sense of reality and objectivity, a recognition that existence exists and A is A, that reality is an absolute not to be evaded or escaped and that the primary responsibility of consciousness is to perceive it, unquote. To explain further, he places no value or consideration higher than reality, no devotion or concern higher than one's respect for facts. He functions by the independent exercise of his own mind, unlike the social metaphysician who functions by passing to others the responsibility of cognition and evaluation and uncritically accepting their verdicts. Let us now turn our attention to the topic of heroism. Andrew Bernstein in his book Heroes, Legends, Champions, Why Heroism Matters defines a hero as follows. A hero is, quote, a morally upright individual who with ability and dauntlessness equal to the task confronts the obstacles and or dangers arising in the pursuit of significant life advancing goals and who triumphs in at least a moral sense. Unquote. Some examples of heroes cited by Bernstein are Ernest Shackleton, Maria Montessori, George Washington Carver, etc. To understand this definition clearly, there are four subpoints that need to be grasped. The first subpoint used in the definition is a hero is a morally upright individual. What does this mean? It means a hero is not and cannot be immoral or evil. Trying to use evil and hero together is like trying to combine two contradictory elements or words together. The next subpoint used in the definition is ability or prowess. It needs to be noted that a hero is someone who has high level of ability or prowess. We will also see that being an everyman or every woman without possessing the highest level of ability will not exclude one from the realm of heroism. What is important to note is that a person with high level of ability has the potential for a higher degree of heroism than an everyman or every woman with relatively lower level of ability, but nevertheless does not lack in moral rectitude. Coming to the issue of dauntlessness, a hero is a person who does not give up in the face of insurmountable difficulties and fights fearlessly against opposition. The next point is very crucial to understand the nature of a hero and to distinguish him from a non-hero, which is a hero acts in pursuit of a significant life advancing or life enhancing goals. Higher the degree to which life is advanced or enhanced, higher is the degree of heroism. It is important to note that if a person is anti-life, that is, seeks goals which destroy life, then such a person is not qualified to be a hero, no matter his superior prowess or dauntlessness in achieving such a task. For example, applying this criterion of being pro-life to a person like Hitler will show that regardless of his efficacy at executing his task of exterminating an entire race of people, he is unqualified to be a hero. Finally, let us look at the issue of victory or triumph. 
It is not necessary that a hero should always triumph existentially. The hero may sometimes fail to accomplish, accomplish his goal or may die in the process of attaining it. What matters is the hero's consistent pursuit of the practice of staying true to the promotion of his values. Now we come to the question of evaluating a person who is heroic in certain respects but is not morally flawless. Although quite rare, it is possible to hold non-contradictory values and abide by rationality in all spheres of human activity. But many humans hold mixed premises, that is, true and false premises, which makes them act sometimes rationally and sometimes irrationally. And heroes are no exception to this, that is, they may display acts of heroism but sometimes indulge in moral act immoral activities. The question is whether such a person should be denounced completely and removed from the pedestal or not. To quote Bernstein, the point in justice is not that the heroic achievement mitigates the moral breach. It does not. Rather, it is that the moral breach does not dim diminish the heroic achievement. So we must rationally assess a person as being heroic to the extent that he shows heroism but make sure that, it, that his moral breaches are judged accordingly without stripping him off from the position of a hero. An example of morally flawed hero given by Bernstein is Thomas Jefferson. The next question is can an everyman rise to the position of a hero or is he forever outside the realm of heroism? because it does not possess extraordinary intellect like that of Einstein or a superior physique like that of Michael Jordan. To answer this, it is important to note that morality plays a vital role in heroism. But morality operates on the principle of volition and everyone is on an equal footing when it comes to volitional adherence to values. So if one chooses to be committed to his values and strives ardently to achieve them, one can not only match the hero in his quality of dauntlessness but also surpass him. But one has to note that there are degrees of heroism and a person who surpasses the everyman in prowess has the potential to be heroic to a greater extent than that of everyman because the magnitude of fulfilling the life enhancing goal is greater for him by virtue of his gifted ability. Finally, coming to the matter of hero worship, is it justified to worship a hero? Certainly, if one wants to live in this world, then one must hold one's life as most precious and highly respected. Because the hero is a person who has helped mankind to further life to a significant extent, one transfers this attitude of respect by paying homage to and celebrating the characteristics of a hero. Bernstein states that, quote, A hero to a hero worshipper is like an aesthetic work to a romantic artist. He or she stylizes his conception, he omits or downplays many factually accurate but secondary characteristics in order that he might emphasize the most salient points. And that by a similar process of abstraction, an honest hero admirer selectively focuses on a hero's prodigious ability to support human life." Unquote. In this regard, it is important to note that a hero worshipper does not copy the hero's inessential characteristics. So the way a hero dresses or his particular accent are not taken seriously by the hero worshipper and are not considered worthy of emulation. He or she recognizes that such, a ca such characteristics are superficial and do not constitute his essence. A hero worshipper does not blindly follow or obey the hero unconditionally as such a blind faith implies failure to grasp a salient characteristic of the hero, namely defiance to authority. Hero worship is of great value to humans as it not only in itself worth contemplating for the feeling of sublime that it arouses but also because it motivates us to emulate the hero and rise to his level of greatness. If you enjoyed this video, then do consider checking out my previous videos where I deal with 
some of the most intriguing questions of life from a philosophical perspective. And if you want to see more videos like this one, make sure to subscribe.